Hello, everyone. I hope you are all healthy and well. Welcome to the next talk in our golden webinars in astrophysics series. My name is Thomas Puzia, and together with Evelyn Johnston, we have organized today's webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, we have arranged for simultaneous language interpretation provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, who will be simultaneously translating for us into Spanish. En sus dispositivos pueden escuchar la interpretación al español de la conferencia al pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra en la parte inferior de la derecha en la ventana Zoom y seleccionar el idioma español. También hemos publicado algunas instrucciones en la ventana de chat que se puede activar con el botón chat abajo en su ventana de Zoom. As there is no such thing as a free lunch, uh, we would also like to acknowledge the generous support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA, for its Spanish acronym, for sponsoring the platform. Uh, thank you all very much for your feedback and comments. If you're watching a recording of this talk on YouTube, please leave your comments below and please share the talks with your family and colleagues uh, if you think that they, that they will find them interesting. If you would like to support the Golden Webinars series please, or give us feedback, please send us an email. Uh, and if you have any questions during the talk, please type them into the Q&A window. You can upvote questions there and comment on them and we'll select the best questions from that window for the discussion after the talk. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our other panel members who are with us today. Um, we of course have Adam Rees, who's going to be uh, talking to us. We have Patricio Gonzalez, our interpreter, uh, Thomas Putzia and myself as usual. And from the faculty at the Institute of Astrophysics at PUC, we have Alejandro Klokiakti, Nelson Padilla, and Ezekiel Trister. We also have our students at PUC, Francisco Carrasco and Alvaro Valenzuela. And we have the great pleasure to welcome our guest panelists today. We have Rohan Rahat Guankar, uh, who is a recent graduate student from the University of Toledo and an intern at the Gemini Observatory. We have Mario Hamui, who is the VP and head of mission of Aura in Chile. We have Lucas Macri, uh, the Associate Dean and Professor of Astrophysics at the Texas A&M University. And finally, we welcome back James Peebles, who is the Albert Einstein Professor of Science at Princeton University and the 2019 Nobel Laureate in Physics. And finally, we also have our excellent team of Q&A managers, Ricardo Acevedo, Daniela Fernandez, and Carol Rojas. It is our great pleasure to introduce Adam Rees as our speaker today. Adam studied for his undergraduate degree at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, finishing in 1992 before moving to Harvard for his PhD, which he gained in 1996. After his PhD, he was appointed as Miller Fellow at Berkeley before moving to the Space Telescope Science Institute as an astronomer in 1999. In 2006, he moved to Johns Hopkins University across the street as a professor of physics, and in 2016, he was appointed a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor. As part of his PhD, he accurately measured the distances to 20 supernovae, and in 1998, he jointly led the study with Brian Schmidt of the High Z Supernova Search Team, which first reported evidence that the universe expansion rate is now accelerating through monitoring type 1A supernova explosions. The work was named Breakthrough of the Year by the Science Magazine in 1998, and Adam was jointly awarded the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics, along with Brian Schmidt and Saul Perlmutter for their groundbreaking discovery. His work today still focuses on the study of supernovae, and he is currently working with the PANS and PANSTARS surveys and is leading the SHOES team in an effort to improve the measurement of the Hubble constant to within 1%. Adam has won numerous awards and prizes during his career, among which are the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011, the Gruber Cosmo uh, Cosmology Prize in 2007, and the Shaw Prize in Astronomy in 2006. And now we'd like to hand over to Adam to tell us about new measurements of the expansion rate of the universe. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a golden webinar in Chile. Uh, Chile looks a lot like my house <laughs> today. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to tell you about recent work measuring uh, pulsating stars called Cepheid variables, exploding stars called type 1a supernovae, uh, parallax measurements, uh, and other ways of measuring the universe 
uh, and how we are using that to determine the rate at which the universe expands, uh, and to our surprise that that rate still appears faster than we thought it would be. Um, if you want to read some technical details about this work, uh, I indicate on the lower left a review talk uh, and a recent uh, paper by the SHOES team uh, on whose behalf I'm going to be speaking. Okay, so let me just uh, back up a little bit and remind you, uh, one of the only ways we have to learn about the composition, age, and fate of the universe is to observe it expanding around us, both uh, in the present time, but also looking far out to see how it was expanding in the past. Now, given that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales, uh, and that it obeys general relativity, we can derive an equation of motion for the universe. How the scale factor, what we call A, the size of the grid you see here on the left, how that scale factor grows with time uh, as a result of gravity and the initial conditions of the universe. That's encapsulated in an equation we call the Friedman equation, which is there on the lower right, uh, describes how the scale factor A changes with time as a result of the composition of the universe on the right-hand side of the Friedman equation. Now, we cannot directly observe A, uh, but we can observe a proxy for it, redshift, the, uh, the stretching of the wavelengths of light that we see. Uh, we cannot directly observe time, uh, but we can measure the distances to objects, and by knowing the speed of light, we can relate time to distance. And so in this way, observers like myself uh, are able to make measurements of this uh, changing uh, expansion rate of the universe. Now, it used to be uh, when we thought the universe was simple and uh, we would say matter dominated, that all the information we sought to learn uh, about the universe, about the changing expansion rate, could be learned from the first two derivatives or changes with time. Uh, the first of these, the first, uh, the change in, in the scale factor with time uh, is called the Hubble constant. It sets the present rate of expansion of the universe. It sets the size scale. Uh, it sets the age scale for the universe. This was once unknown to a very large factor of two, uh, but in recent years, uh, it's known to higher precision. The other is the second derivative of A, what we call the deceleration parameter, because it tells us how much the expansion of the universe is slowing down. Uh, we expected that due to the matter in the universe and the attractive gravity of that matter, that the universe would be slowing in its expansion. And by measuring uh, at what rate it was slowing, we could learn whether the universe would expand forever, that is what its ultimate fate was, which would tell us also things about the origin uh, of the universe and the viability of some of our best theories of what happened shortly after the Big Bang. Now, the 1990s was really, I would say, a special time for this endeavor. Uh, because of the development uh, of tools that could be used to measure really long range distances in the universe. Now, I'm going to be talking about measuring distances by looking at how bright distant objects are. Uh, such objects are called standard candles, and there's a simple relationship between uh, how bright they are uh, and how far away they are, just knowing their luminosity, or at least their relative luminosity. Uh, and I'm going to be discussing two types of standard candles. The very luminous type 1a supernovae, these are stars that explode uh, when we believe they're at an end state of their life called a white dwarf. They approach uh, a critical mass called the Chandrasekhar limit. Uh, the details of how this happens are still not perfectly known. We believe they live in some kind of binary system and mass transfers over until the star reaches that limit or near it. Uh, when these explode, they're as bright as a billion solar luminosities. Um, the other kind of standard candle I'm going to talk about is a more regular star. It's a giant star that pulsates uh, sort of in and out. These are called Cepheid variables. Uh, they're not as luminous as the type 1a supernovae, but they're much more common. They're about 100,000 times the luminosity of the sun. And there's a good correspondence between the uh, period uh, in which they pulsate, how long it takes them to go from maximum to minimum and back to maximum brightness, and how luminous they are. That's understood pretty well from first principles. Now, uh, in practice, we don't just look at these standard candles and determine how far away they are. We sometimes have to make small corrections uh, for 
small subtle differences in their luminosity and that's a sort of a separate technical talk to give uh, and in addition uh, sometimes we are observing these standard candles through dust intervening in the galaxies in which they live uh, that dust tends to shift the colors of the light and so we correct for that as well and so there are, are small corrections that are made um, by the mid-1990s, we saw really the building of what I would call the modern Hubble diagram of type 1a supernovae. The first and I think most important of these studies came in Chile from the Colón Tololo survey done by Mario Moy, who's one of the panelists uh, and others uh, on his team, who found, I think it was 29 type 1a supernovae. Uh, and well delineated the Hubble expansion. Uh, in my doctoral thesis uh, in the North, I made a modest contribution to this with a, a small number of additional supernovae so that between the two, uh, you could see very sharply the expansion of the universe. Uh, this demonstrated that individual type 1a supernovae yielded distances that were precise to about 6%. Um, now, astronomers like, of course, to uh, use a funny kind of uh, system of measurements called magnitudes. Uh, it's a logarithmic system of brightness or distance, similar to the decibel scale or the Richter scale. And in our system, uh, five magnitudes is a factor of 100 in brightness, which then would translate to a factor of 10 in distance. Now, in order to determine the actual Hubble constant, that is to determine absolute distances, one would have to calibrate the true luminosity of one of these type 1a supernovae by, I'll just say, as though you could run a tape measure out to one of these supernovae. Uh, now I'll talk more about that later, but it turns out in the 1990s, this was quite hard to do. And so uh, we sort of moved on with only maybe 10 to 15% precision in the Hubble constant to another related problem, this of measuring the change in the expansion rate of the universe. And that could be done by extending this Hubble diagram to greater redshifts and distances that is further back in time to see how the expansion rate of the universe was changing. Um, and as mentioned in the beginning of this talk and probably many people are familiar with, about 20 years ago, my colleagues and I from the high Z supernova team, and I wanna mention Alejandro Clociati, who's here from the high Z supernova team, uh, two teams went out and found very distant supernovae uh, at redshift of a half and saw to our surprise that those supernovae were fainter than expected, implying that the expansion of the universe was not slowing down at all. It was actually speeding up. That is, you needed something quite different than uh, matter uh, slowing the expansion. You needed something more like Einstein's cosmological constant. Uh, and of course, uh, as I said, this was a great surprise to the two teams and, and many others, of course, as well. Now, at the time, we worried if there was some kind of uh, astrophysical effect causing the dimming of these distant supernovae we were seeing. Maybe there was some kind of gray dust in the universe that wasn't giving the telltale color shift, or perhaps the distant supernovae were just born fainter. Uh, a very powerful test, therefore, was to go to out to even higher redshifts because uh, when the universe was even younger, it would have been dominated by the attractive gravity of matter in it. And so it would have been decelerating before it began accelerating. That is, we would see a relative brightening again of the supernovae. Um, and so over the next decade, uh, I led an effort to find even more distant supernovae with the Hubble Space Telescope while at the same time, many projects from the ground collected many more supernovae. So fast forward more than a decade later, and there are some 1300 type 1a supernovae, which do a great job of really demonstrating the details of this transition from acceleration to deceleration, particularly with the Hubble Space Telescope data at very high redshift. Um, and so uh, our confidence uh, increased and uh, this is the reality that we have to live with of a universe that's accelerating. Um, it's actually quite remarkable to look at the uh, improvement in the quality of the data in the 20 years of this effort. Uh, our original discovery data constrained the mass density of the universe and this cosmological constant in these large contours you see, uh, my former graduate student, Dan Skolnick, has put together the largest compilation of supernova data, the Pantheon sample, which now you can see lives in a very, very tiny area of confidence within that confidence. Now, it's not just supernova data which allow us to reach this conclusion. Uh, I'll say more about this later, but 
other techniques, including a technique called baryon acoustic oscillations, uh, measurements of large scale structure, and from the cosmic microwave background, all converge on this picture of a universe filled with this kind of dark energy that is accelerating the universe. Now, what is this dark energy or why is it that the universe is accelerating? Uh, and of course, that's what makes this maybe one of the most interesting topics in cosmology because we don't really know or understand the detailed physics. Uh, however, we have some sort of general ideas. The first borrows an idea from quantum theory that there should be a background energy or some constant energy of empty space. Uh, and uh, the fact that having such energy then in the realm of general relativity would indeed produce this kind of repulsive gravity which would accelerate the universe. However, there's a terrible inconsistency between those two theories that leaves us far from being able to calculate from first principles or with any real detail this picture. Another possibility is that there is another field in space, an energy field that's temporary, uh, maybe changing with time, but could mimic a cosmological constant for some period of time. There are what I would call existence proofs for both of these ideas elsewhere in physics. A third possibility, of course, is that we don't yet have the right theory of gravity, that our theory of gravity is breaking down on the scale of the entire universe. Um, and so without a real clear direction, uh, we sort of move forward in a new, I would say, paradigm or way, which is we generally assume, number one, that it is that the dark energy is Einstein's cosmological constant or a constant vacuum energy, because really it's the easiest thing to calculate. And then we predict the results of experiments based on that and look for departures from those experiments. And now I'm going to tell you about current work, which I think of as sort of the grandest of those tests of the paradigm that may shed light on the nature of dark energy or any of the other mysteries. Uh, and so I bring you to the present time where we have this standard model of cosmology, what we call lambda CDM, or uh, what I might also call vanilla lambda CDM, because we take the simplest form it could have, where uh, it's described just by six numbers, six what we call parameters, and a number of ansatz. Uh, and we take that model as it would have looked shortly after the Big Bang, around the time of what we call recombination, when the universe would have looked like the prescription in the upper left there. And we use that model to predict how shortly after the Big Bang, how uh, what the physical size of fluctuations in the early plasma of the universe would have looked like, uh, including foremost what we call the sound horizon, the distance that one of those fluctuations can travel uh, in the age of the universe shortly after the Big Bang, just a few hundred thousand years. Um, or alternatively, we can use the model to predict what the density of baryons ought to be in the universe. We then actually make measurements. We observe the angular fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, or alternatively, we measure the baryon density. And in that step, by observing that and comparing it to the model, we essentially calibrate those six free parameters of the model. We then use the evolving form of the model um, all the way to as it would look today, as you see in the lower left, where it becomes dominated by dark energy and dark matter. And that predicts how the universe will expand over time, all the way up to the present moment. That is, it predicts the present expansion rate or Hubble constant today. And this is best done with the Planck CMB data yielding 67.4 plus or minus 0.5. We have some guardrails or tests along the way, uh, some other tools that tell us we are following the right curves in this road, but they don't tell us that we necessarily have the right story. And so a powerful end-to-end -end test of this whole story, particularly of the 95% of the universe that at present time uh, is dark, the form of dark matter, or dark energy, whose microphysics we don't really understand, a powerful end-to-end -end test is to actually go out and measure the present expansion rate of the universe and compare it to the predicted value. So a little more than 10 years ago, uh, my colleagues, uh, Lucas Mockery, who is uh, on, this, uh, one, on the panel as well, uh, and others, we began a project to try to do just that, to try to uh, reach a percent level measurement of the expansion rate of the universe. 
uh, by building a strong and simple distance ladder to reach great distances. But now to, as I said, run the, the tape measure out to the supernovae and determine not just relative distances, but absolute distances. And so we thought we could do this with geometric techniques used to calibrate those pulsating Cepheid stars I talked about, and then in uh, distant galaxies to use those to calibrate the type 1a supernovae. Now, we saw ways to reduce systematic uncertainties along the way over past measurements, particularly by collecting the data in a very consistent manner that I'll describe, as well as by making observations in the near infrared. Um, we also thought it was very important to uh, propagate all statistical and systematic errors from the beginning to the end through the entire process to get a realistic error budget. Uh, and uh, finally, just to say, this was not a, a dedicated project. This was a series of 17 individual uh, proposals to the Hubble Space Telescope over the course of about 17 years, uh, about 1,000 orbits of Hubble Space Telescope time to collect this data. So let me start at the beginning. What is a distance ladder uh, and why do we build it? Well, we build it to measure great distances. Uh, and in principle, a distance ladder is really quite simple and very empirical. Uh, you use geometry, uh, various ways to calibrate the luminosity of, in this case, a Cepheid. This is what we call the anchor step, usually done at distances of kiloparsecs to megaparsecs. Then we look at galaxies which recently hosted type 1a supernovae and look for Cepheid variables in those galaxies with the Hubble Space Telescope. These, this is done at distances of 10 to 40 megaparsecs. And finally, type 1a supernovae, which are seen well out into the expansion of the universe uh, and their redshifts to uh, determine the Hubble constant. Now, uh, just a couple of things to point out here. As I said, this is totally empirical. Uh, there's no astrophysical modeling of the sources. Uh, there's really no use of general relativity or the cosmological model either. This is, as I said, geometric to run a tape measure out to distant supernovae. However, something that's really critical uh, in these measurements is to measure the same kind of objects at different locations uh, fully consistently with the same telescopes if possible and in every other way the same so that you don't introduce some kind of systematic errors. So let me start with the first step, measuring geometric distances. Uh, you may have uh, learned in Astro 101, this is quite simple. You just measure parallax of distant objects. The problem is that uh, stars, particularly Cepheid variables, uh, tend to be very far away. And so the parallax angle, the angle through which a nearby star moves with respect to distant stars as the Earth goes around the sun is very small. Uh, for typical Milky Way Cepheids, which are a few kiloparsecs away, uh, this movement of the star is about one one hundredth of a pixel on the Hubble Space Telescope's main camera over the course of a year. That's a very small number to measure. Uh, however, uh, we've developed new techniques to do just that, uh, just to describe the, those techniques. Ordinarily, when you measure one star's position relative to another star, uh, you would be limited in your ability to locate or centroid that star uh, by about one hundredth of a pixel due to the nature of the uh, finite ability to make those measurements. Uh, but that's for a single observation. We uh, had a, an idea a few years ago, if we spatially scan the telescope during the observations, instead of uh, collecting individual points, we would essentially collect lines. We would, uh, the equivalent of many of those images of single points, and that would allow us to reduce the error by making many comparisons uh, between the stars. Uh, if you're still confused what I'm talking about, we literally uh, move the telescope and these points turn into lines and we are able to compare the separation between stars over and over. Here's a tiny patch of one of those spatial scan images showing the great information content available in these many scan lines. And then we go in and extract each of these scan lines, uh, scan by scan, we align them in time um, and one of the first things we noticed is there's an additional kind of noise in the data, which is true in all regular imaging data as well, jitter of the telescope as it moves or bounces in the direction uh, perpendicular to the scan. But we only care to measure the separation between stars. And since that jitter is consistent amongst all stars, 
when we take the difference in the position of two stars, as you see here in the bottom, the jitter uh, is removed and we get to average over thousands of pixels. Uh, with this technique, we found we could get to 20 to 40 micro arc seconds, the equivalent of one one thousandth of a pixel on the Hubble Space Telescope. So after a few years of making these observations, we found we were able to measure the parallaxes of some of the more distant Cepheids. This back and forth motion you see uh, for each of these is the parallax of one single Cepheid. The inverse of it tells us the distance. And with a handful of these, we were able to measure uh, the luminosity of Cepheid variables to about 3%. Independent of this, a European space agency mission called Gaia has been measuring the parallaxes of many more Cepheids using powerful techniques. Um, we have been simultaneously observing the brightnesses of those Cepheids to put them on the same Hubble Space Telescope scale as distant Cepheids. Um, and so just showing you what some of that data looks like, measuring the uh, brightness of those Cepheids. This, was done so far for 50 Milky Way Cepheids with the so far less precise Gaia parallaxes. This also gives us a 3% calibration of the luminosity. Um, in the next coming months, Gaia is poised to greatly improve the precision of their distances. And we've expanded the sample of such Cepheids that should reach a uh, at least a 1% calibration. So between these two techniques that I described from Gaia and from spatial scanning, as well as a previous generation of such parallax measurements, there are now three ways to calibrate the luminosity of Cepheids and flesh out the period luminosity relationship for Cepheids in the Milky Way over the same period range uh, that we see Cepheids in distant galaxies. Uh, now, when Gaia reaches its final advertised precision, uh, this should reach about 0.4% uncertainty in the Hubble constant. Now, um, there's not just one way to run a tape measure out to uh, these stars, uh, even by parallax. There are other geometric techniques that have become very powerful in the last few years. Uh, another one of those techniques is uh, the method of detached eclipsing binaries in the Large Magellanic Cloud, where you determine the physical size of a star orbiting another star through the eclipses, and you determine the angular size through a relationship with interferometry. So that gives you a geometric distance to those stars. That's been done to about 1.2% in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And uh, the geometric measurements from masers uh, orbiting in Keplerian motion around a supermassive black hole in a particular distant galaxy called NGC 4258 is also now good to about 1.5%. And my colleague, Lucas Mockery, has observed many Cepheids in that galaxy uh, to bring that into the set of ways to calibrate Cepheid variables. Now, then we can move on to rung two in our dis simple distance ladder, which is to look at nearby galaxies which already hosted type 1a supernovae and look at Cepheid variables in those. Now, this is really the rate limiting step for measuring the Hubble constant because, as I said, each supernova is good to about 6%. And so, uh, over the square root of the number that you can observe will limit the Hubble constant. Uh, and this has been slow going. Uh, up until just a few years ago, there were only 19 of these objects we could so calibrate. Uh, over the last few years, we have collected observations of 19 more to bring the total by the end of this year to 38. That is all of the type 1a supernovae that are available for these kinds of measurements. The galaxy must be at least uh, within about 40 or 50 megaparsecs to be able to make these measurements. And nature produces a type 1a supernova in that volume about once every year or year and a half. And so once we've completed this sample at the end of the year, it will be very difficult to uh, increase it further. However, the good news is that really should get us close to that 1% mark uh, that we're trying to reach. Now, here are the period luminosity relationships of the individual Cepheid stars in each of these galaxies that hosted a type 1a supernovae and in the anchor galaxies that we use to measure the relative distances. Um, now, I advertised early on in this talk that we could reduce systematic errors over past measurements. One of the ways we do that is we observe the Cepheid variables with the same telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, and the same instrument and the same filters and the same range of properties of those Cepheids in both the anchor galaxy where we geometrically calibrate them 
and in the supernova hosts. And this has been done for all of the various anchor galaxies. Now, on the right, you see the light curves of all of the Cepheid variables in each of these galaxies and in the box for the anchor galaxy, NGC 4258, as an example. Um, finally, we reduce systematic errors by making our observations of Cepheid variables in the near infrared. Most standard candles are better distance indicators in the near infrared because you can see through dust more easily. It has less of an impact on the measurements. Uh, they're also less sensitive, uh, uh, the objects, to differences in their chemical abundances. This is nicely seen in the large Magellanic cloud, where as you go uh, on the bottom of this from the optical to the near infrared at the top, you see the scatter of the period luminosity relationship go down quite uh, markedly. So the third step, which uh, alludes to what I showed earlier in this talk, is just that type 1a supernovae do a great job of measuring the expansion rate of the universe. And so we can determine the intercept, or what I would call the characteristic brightness of a type 1a supernova at a, a given redshift, uh, and then once calibrated, determine the value of the Hubble constant. Uh, as I said, this is actually all done simultaneously with a system of equations uh, that relates the Cepheids uh, in their geometric calibration to the brightnesses of Cepheids in the anchor galaxies, and finally to the type 1a supernovae in the Hubble flow. Uh, it amounts to a system of simultaneous equations, uh, covariance between related data, and finally leads to the determination of two numbers, the absolute luminosity of a type 1a supernova and the intercept of the Hubble diagram, which then relates directly to the value of the Hubble constant. So if you actually look not at the set of equations, but the resulting data from this, you could see, again, the three steps that I talk about. Uh, there are uh, five sources of geometric calibration. There's actually a couple of new ones I'll mention later in the talk. Uh, that are used to calibrate the luminosity of the Cepheid variables. And then, as I said, the second step where the Cepheids calibrate the type 1a supernovae, and the third step where type 1a supernovae calibrate redshift and the Hubble constant. And the most recent value we get is 73 and a half plus or minus 1.4, a total uncertainty of 1.9%. Uh, now, if you remember from early in this talk, I quoted a value from Planck that you may remember was quite a bit lower than this. And that is true. There's about a 4.2 sigma difference between these. So uh, let's explore that uh, difference a little bit further. Um, a few years ago, I will say 10 or 15 years ago, the hardest part of these measurements was the geometric calibration step, that very first step. Uh, and that has advanced tremendously over the last few years. And so we can now break out the individual value of the Hubble constant we would get from any of really seven different ways now to uh, precisely geometrically calibrate Cepheids uh, using NGC 4258 as the top line. The detached eclipsing binary method is the second line. Uh, the original parallax measurements from the fine guidance sensor on the Hubble Space Telescope, the new spatial scan ones uh, our team did, the comb combination of the parallaxes from Gaia and the photometry from HST, or two new ones uh, just in the last few months using uh, not the parallaxes of the Cepheids, but of their binary companions or their cluster hosts. Uh, and all these all give very compatible results for the Hubble constant. Uh, they vary within about two sigma. And what's important is these methods really have quite independent systematics uh, in almost all cases, even in cases where they use the same instrument, they use it in a different way. Uh, I could say more about that in the Q&A. So there doesn't look like any relief from this problem <laughs> by choosing a, a different anchor. Now, what about other systematics? Well, a, a useful metric to keep in mind is the difference we're seeing between Planck and the local universe represents about two tenths of a magnitude or 20% in the brightness of any of these objects, Cepheids or type 1a supernovae. So in our analysis, we came up with 23 variants of the analysis, different ways of describing the dust in the galaxies that host Cepheids or host type 1a supernovae, whether to fit the period luminosity relationship as a single slope or multiple slopes, uh, where to start the Hubble flow of type 1a supernovae locally or further out to avoid any large scale structure, uh, what kind of host galaxies to uh, consider for the type 1a supernovae? All types, those just in spiral galaxies, those in locally star forming galaxies. And in all these variations, it makes little difference because of the uh, good matching between samples uh, for supernovae between rungs two and three or Cepheids between rungs uh, one and two. 
Um, other frequently asked questions to uh, resolve this riddle, could we live in a giant void, uh, an area uh, pretty devoid of matter so that the local universe expands faster? Um, large scale structure theory uh, that simulates how often you get clumps or voids like that uh, rules that out quite strongly at, I would say, 15 sigma. And also the type 1a supernova Hubble diagram itself rules that out quite strongly. We could extend the Hubble diagram to redshift 1, and we see no evidence of crossing through a kind of void, uh, which would be evident in a kind of wrinkle in the Hubble diagram. There are multiple papers on this. You could have variations at 0.6% in the Hubble constant due to this, but not uh, anywhere near the full 9%. Um, is the instrument on the Hubble Space Telescope Widefield Camera 3, has its flux scale been calibrated well enough to make these measurements? Uh, and I would say yes. Most recently, it's been calibrated across 15 magnitudes uh, to introduce maybe about 0.3% uncertainty in the Hubble constant, but not uh, anything like this larger amount. Could what uh, astronomers call crowding of the Cepheids uh, of their brightnesses compromise the accuracy? Uh, and I would say no. Most recently, uh, our team has put out a paper showing that the amplitudes of the Cepheids match the uh, expected amount of crowding, which is already taken into account in the analysis. Uh, is there a difference between the supernovae themselves at the two ends of the distance ladder? And I would say no. We've looked at correlations of the Hubble residuals for supernovae. Again, they could introduce errors at 0.3%, uh, but not anything near this level that we see. Um, over the last few years, most of the improvements we have realized uh, have come from the anchor step or the first step. But this has been a gradual process, going back to the Hubble Space Telescope Key Project in 2001 and to through five iterations uh, of this project, we have uh, kept a focus on the error budget uh, and address different terms in it by different specific experiments uh, or uh, methods to uh, go through those. Um, nobody should be, I think, dramatically surprised. I, I would say one of the big advantages of this work using Cepheids to calibrate supernovae is it's probably the most widely replicated method to measure the expansion rate of the universe. It's been uh, the most used, I would say, over the last 20 years, and it's given very consistent results uh, over that time. We've seen uh, this work done with different instruments on the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, done by different teams, uh, including, as I said, the key project whose final result with a recalibration uh, in 2012 was very similar to the results we find now. Uh, they measured the brightnesses in different ways over different wavelengths. We've seen people from the Planck team take the data and reanalyze it themselves and get very consistent results. Uh, we've seen people use different sets of supernovae, uh, use different uh, complex analyses techniques, Bayesian analyses, not just the simple multilinear regressions that we use. Uh, in fact, this has even turned into a graduate student problem set uh, in the University of Toronto Astro Statistics class. And I've seen the solution set uh, from the professor and uh, it is the same answer that we get. So <laughs> that's a little reassuring. Um, why do we use Cepheids uh, for this calibration? Um, and the reason so many people have really used them for a while is they are the longest range distance indicator uh, before you get to supernovae. They have the most uh, independent calibrations. Uh, they uh, have the only ability to generate consistent measurements across the distance ladder for technical reasons I could describe later. Uh, but really, they're the most tested, I think, at this point. Now, they're not the only way, though, to measure the Hubble constant. So uh, last year, we had a conference uh, over this sort of controversy or, or struggle uh, where other techniques uh, were um, uh, provided, were uh, uh, presented. Uh, and uh, some of these built type 1a supernova distance ladders with other kinds of stars, Cepheid variables here, uh, other kinds of pulsating stars called Myras a technique called tip of the red giant branch calibrated in different ways uh, or strong lensing. Uh, there were other distance ladders altogether. Surface brightness fluctuations is a different method. I'll mention another one later. Or there were single rung techniques, uh, lensing or masers directly into the Hubble flow. Now, you can't just naively average all these things because some of them use overlapping data. However, you can sort of order off of this menu, like ordering off of a prefix menu, uh, to build an average that is uh, independent by taking one thing from category one, uh, one supernova distance ladder, one thing from category two, from category three and four, uh, and then a peremptory challenge, something that you could choose uh, not to use. And so here are the various data combinations, uh, I show this in a recent review, uh, making these different choices and showing that the 
average nearby value is quite consistently higher than we see in the early universe. Now, uh, you can't really blame the Planck measurements. There are other uh, ways of measuring uh, or predicting, calibrating the cosmological model and predicting the Hubble constant using other cosmic microwave background experiments to then calibrate uh, a remnant of the cosmic microwave background uh, called baryon acoustic oscillations, or to use a big bang nucleosynthesis uh, measurements uh, in a similar way. Uh, and we pretty consistently see this difference between the early prediction of today's expansion rate and what we actually see. Um, I could form a matrix uh, of those differences. Here are all the late universe measurements on the x-axis in order of their precision. And the early universe measurements on the y-axis, we can then convert that into uh, how many standard deviations apart these measurements are. And if we focus particularly on the measurements coming from Planck, since those are, after all, the most precise, we can see that this difference is quite consistent, whether it's coming from using Cepheids or tip of the red giant branch, uh, Myras, uh, or um, all measurements that don't use lensing or don't use supernovae. So there's no one single, I would say, peremptory challenge that uh, gets rid of this problem. Um, so what's going on? Uh, I don't know. Uh, one possibility is a physics-based solution, which might be some kind of change in the cosmological model, either at late times or early times. Uh, it turns out that late times look harder because there is additional data at late times in high redshift supernovae and baryon acoustic oscillations that limit uh, how much you could change, for example, dark energy or um, uh, other properties of the curvature, other properties of the universe. Uh, it looks a little easier to change the early universe. Uh, if you change the physics of the cosmological model before recombination, particularly, and I direct you to this uh, paper, the Hubble Hunter's Guide by Knox and Malaya, if you inject energy, I will say generically, into the universe before recombination, you will cause it to expand faster, to become transparent earlier, uh, and shrink the sound horizon, which is essentially the equivalent uh, fundamental standard ruler of the early universe uh, and potentially bring these into better agreement. It has to be done in a just so way not to uh, mess up other features of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, one particularly uh, uh, pursued way uh, is a technique called, well, is a, uh, an addition called early dark energy where there is another episode of uh, dark energy, not just uh, after the big bang in inflation or at present time acceleration, but a third. Uh, some people may think three times is just too many. Others may see uh, an appealing connection between all of these. Uh, another uh, idea I've heard recently is uh, the production of small scale, uh, mildly nonlinear inhomogeneities in the early universe with a primordial magnetic field, um, something that uh, again would happen before recombination. I think the theoretical community is having a, a good time playing with different possibilities. Um, another recent development that I'll say is worth keeping in the back of one's mind is another, what I would say, tension between uh, the early universe predicting how the late universe should look and what we actually see in the late universe. And that is in another cosmological parameter called sigma eight, which measures the clumpiness of matter in space. Um, previously, this had been seen uh, through uh, nearby measurements of a technique called weak lensing uh, that were giving consistently lower values than the Planck uh, uh, CMB data predicts. Uh, the Planck predictions are in blue. The lensing measurements are in green, uh, or sorry, they're in uh, orange here. Uh, and then more recently through peculiar velocity measurements coming from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that also deviate at about three sigma. Um, and so, or alternatively, I, I should mention, predict a uh, uh, indicated value of the Hubble constant greater than 70. Um, so it's kind of intriguingly similar to see uh, another tension uh, in the same way between the early universe prediction and the late universe that might be telling us about the cosmological model uh, and some recent measurements using a, a different technique for measuring the late universe's expansion rate uh, called the Tully-Fisher method uh, calibrated by either Cepheids or tip of the red giant branch are also giving this consistently uh, higher result. So. Uh, you might be wondering, can we really believe these measurements of a discrepancy without uh, a deep explanation? And I would say, sure. Uh, <laughs> this happens all the time in science, uh, and particularly in uh, physics. 
uh, where we see and well measure some phenomenon, the precession of the orbit of Mercury, uh, the solar neutrino problem, the missing baryon problem before, sometimes decades go by before we're creative enough or uh, able to deconstruct what is actually going on. Uh, we even have problems today that have mostly relabeled uh, our lack of understanding. The flat rotation curves are dark matter and the acceleration of the universe is dark energy but we're still not done really understanding those things. There's a, are deep problems uh, that belie these. For example, why is Lambda as small as it is, is a real problem in understanding the nature of dark energy. So I think we wanna be careful not to uh, look at our lack of explanation as uh, an indication of whether we believe measurements or not, uh, but rather you know, keep these problems with us uh, until we are able to figure out what's going on. So, uh, this year, we expect to improve, uh, hopefully quite significantly, the present measure of the expansion of the universe, which might give us more clues as to what's going on. We have more of these Cepheid supernova calibrators uh, that are being measured now, uh, as well as making Cepheid measurements all the way out to coma to build even a two-rung distance ladder. Um, so looking ahead with Gaia Data Release 3 due in December and these additional measurements, we ought to be able to get to maybe about 1.2% uncertainty, I hope. Um, also, there are other techniques that uh, people are beginning to employ, uh, gravitational waves uh, from the LIGO Observatory to uh, measure the expansion rate of the universe, uh, other missions on the ground and in space, DESI, LSST, WFIRST, and Euclid, that will better characterize uh, the equation of state of dark energy today, and that will help either point the finger at dark energy causing this problem, or uh, I would say, um, let it off the hook completely. Um, there are also new uh, CMB experiments that may see signatures of this early dark energy. So I would say this is an active problem of research that one should stay tuned to. Uh, I'll just leave with some summary. Um, I think the discrepancy is very real. Uh, I would say it is about five sigma. It really depends on which data you combine. It could be as low as four sigma or as high as six sigma. Um, however, I think a fair description is there's really no precise late universe measurement that is coming in lower than any of the early universe measurements. That's just a restatement of the fact that we are seeing a consistent discrepancy. Um, it appears to be robust because uh, we can't think of even one systematic that could cause this because there are so many independent experiments involved it would really require multiple catastrophic failures, I think, at this point. Uh, I think it's very interesting, unless uh, you're Bayesian prior, another way of saying you are so confident in vanilla lambda CDM at more than five sigma, uh, I think this is uh, an interesting thing to pay attention to. Uh, and I don't know what's going on, and I don't uh, pretend to know what's going on, but I think you know we really should follow the evidence uh, and allow our theorist uh, colleagues to be creative. Uh, and always, of course, remember that the universe might be more clever uh, than we are right now. And uh, I will end uh, there. So uh, thank you very much for listening and maybe we can move on to the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, do we have any questions or any, uh, any suggestions from the panel, first of all? Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands, so. May, may I start? <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful talk, Adam. Um, so how can we make headway in, in um, you know, characterizing this, this vacuum energy? Um, is there any way you can look at dipole moments in, in the expansion? I mean, the samples are large enough to maybe start doing that. Have you seen it? Right. Um, well, so as I said, there are multiple missions and experiments that uh, are under development now, or really almost starting now, uh, that will measure uh, these features I talked about, supernovae, baryon acoustic oscillations, lensing, to higher precision and at higher redshifts uh, to better characterize the equation of state of dark energy. If uh, we can rule out that it's minus one at all times, then we will have learned something tremendous that it's not a, a cosmological constant. If it remains looking like minus one at all redshifts, um, it won't help us at all, but uh, in terms of probably being sure about what dark energy is, but uh, it will help us on the Hubble constant tension problem because it will tell us it's not funny late dark energy causing that. So all of those missions, all of those diagnostics that you mentioned, they have, of course, the, the maximum diagnostic epoch in the evolution of the universe, right? So that's right, so that's right. Yeah, I mean, most of the, the action of dark energy has been recent. So 
the, you don't want to go to too high a redshift to measure. Most of the leverage still comes below, I would say, redshift of two or even one. So what, yeah, so you wouldn't say that, let's say, with experiments like, uh, you know, espresso, uh, where you would do the quasar tomography of, of space out to redshift six, that this would not, not help significantly? Right. You know, I would never tell somebody not to do a cosmological measurement that uh, will measure something in a way we've never had before in a, in a region of time and space we never had before. But, you know, if you were writing down a prescription for how to address dark energy uh, that we see, you know, I wouldn't tell you to go to Redshift 6. Uh, you know, I would tell you to stay local and uh, because that's when dark energy is dominant. And so, you know, that's when you get the best lever arm. Hey, Alejandro uh, has a, actually Ezekiel has just said he's got a follow-up question. Yeah, it's a little bit, uh, well, first, thank you very much, Anna, for your wonderful talk. Uh, it's a bit of a follow-up, but uh, I've been following with great interest uh, using the work that uh, Elisabetta Luso and others have been doing about using quasars as a standard candles. And the big advantage, of course, is that uh, you can push it down now to relative seven and a half or so. And they're finding that uh, when you go to, to up to relative two, they're consistent with the supernova, but when you go to high relative, it's not that you require maybe a dark energy that evolves that increases, the density increases with time. So I was wondering, uh, I would like to blend two questions. And first, do you think there are any prospect to span supernova, maybe with JWST to much higher relatives? Or and what do you think of that? What do you think that having an increase in dark energy helps you? <laughs> Um, well, let me say, you know, in general first about the quasars. I mean, again, I would encourage people to make measurements in a way that they haven't before because you always might learn something. You know, I think we're cautious about the quasars because while I describe these very natural mechanisms that make supernovae and cepheids and, and certain other things very natural standard candles, uh, it's a, quite a head scratcher that uh, quasars could be such good standard candles. And in fact, we see a really huge dynamic range of quasars, even after you make one small correction, you know, the, the dispersion is still, you know, an order of magnitude more than type 1a supernovae, much higher than the measurement errors. And so, so you always wonder what is hiding in that dispersion if you can't explain it. So I would say, you know, I'm very cautious about the interpretation of, of quasars. Um, however, you know, making those measurements could be useful to help constrain curvature. Um, I think it's possible with some of the new missions, we could extend type 1a supernovae to redshift two, two and a half, three. Um, I mean, there's a big question mark of how high a redshift they're still out there because uh, it takes nature some amount of time to produce a type 1a supernova that starts to challenge, you know, the age of the universe at redshift three or so. Um, but I think it will be interesting to see. Okay, I think Jim had a comment. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Adam, that was a wonderful lecture. I should remind you that I wrote down CDM and then Lambda CDM in the early 1980s. I meant it only as a counterexample to the apparent problem of accounting for the distinctly clumpy distribution of matter and very smooth microwave background radiation. It's absolutely astounding to me that it has done as well as it has. I've been waiting a long time for corrections to appear, and I'm hoping you found it a hint. Well, let me let me make a comment on that. What you, you, you take Lambda CDM more or less as you envisioned it, and more or less as it was fitting data 20 years ago, let's say shortly after the supernova discovery, and then came the assault from the CMB, uh, the squeezing down of the parameter space by a factor of 100,000, I'll say the observational <laughs> assault, and yet that didn't break it. Right. Uh, that is, in addition, very surprising and remarkable that it survived, you know, five orders of magnitude of squeezing. Um, however, you know, at some point, generally all models break because, you know, they're just, they're, they're models, they're not actually nature. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, there's a lot of ignorance in Lambda CDM. And so, you know, I, it's reasonable to think it might break at some point. It would be disappointing if it didn't provide us a clue along the way by, you know, breaking in a uh, 
you know, useful way. <laughs> I quite agree, um, Adam. And I guess we all share the ambivalence. On the one hand, Lambda CDM has passed an enormous number of tests, astounding. On the other hand, we sure hope that there's more to be learned as right. from hints of the sort you're giving us. Right. I mean, this is not, you know, I'll say this is not a faith based endeavor, right? We don't say, wow, Lambda CDM survived, you know, such a such a rigorous test that uh, if we go more rigorous, I'm confident it will survive. I mean, we don't, right? We just continue to make the measurements and, uh, you know, see where where we learn. Um, okay. So Alejandro had a question. Yes. Uh, I am thinking about this, uh, Adam. Uh, most of the discrepancy, uh, I mean, most of it comes from the uh, Planck measurements. How sure are we about that? I mean, could it be that? Yeah. You know, a few years ago, I think a few years ago, you could have said, oh, you know, maybe there's a problem with Planck. But uh, more recently, there's been some really good data from the ACT, uh, ACT, uh, ground-based polarization CMB uh, experiment, which really independently comes up with the same result, 67, uh, from the CMB. And if you combine ACT with BAO, it's basically with the same error bar as Planck or very close to it. Uh, so that's a very powerful uh, cross check, I would say. I mean, it doesn't tell you that we have the right physics of the universe before recombination, but uh, you know, it tells you that it isn't you know a problem in data reduction from Planck. Okay, uh, I can see Mario with his hand up. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you, Adam. Great talk. Um, as you may know, uh, this past week, uh, I published uh, with my group of collaborators a paper in AstroPH in which we analyzed the determination of the Hubble Metre constant from the cosmic distance ladder for type 1a supernovae. Uh, in the course of our work, we found it difficult to reproduce your latest results since the Cepheid distances anchored to the LMC have not been published. So what do you think about the importance that all data used in such an important subject be readily available for users for the using their work? Right. So um, we published those distances in our 2016 paper, you know, a table of all the individual values. Our 2019 paper was based on an improvement in the anchor, the first step. And so that improvement just shifts by a constant number, all of those distances. And so you interpreted that correctly, I thought in your paper uh, where you said, oh, this looks like it'll just be a constant shift. We can apply to all those. I mean, we don't normally publish a new table with a lot of numbers if they all are changing by a constant amount. We usually just indicate you know, a new zero point for this. And so the, in that case, it was only the zero point that was, was changing. And as I said, I mean, if you had shot me an email, I would have said, you know, to do exactly what you did uh, to just shift the, the zero point by that constant amount. Thank you. Okay, so let's move to the Q&A. I believe Nelson had a, had a question that he wanted to ask. Um, yes, uh, thanks very much, Adam. It's a great talk. And uh, there are a few questions uh, regarding, for example, explanation to the to, to a possible variation of expansion rate, but coming from the dark matter sector. So, for example, Chico Jablonski asks whether, for example, that dark matter decay could produce uh, the variation in the expansion rate. And I don't know. I think there's also some uh, there also been some ideas of uh, primordial black hole evaporation that could also be. Uh, Right. Well, you know, right. I mean, these are things, these are interesting ideas that have to be worked out in detail. I mean, you know, any, you know, significant alteration, you know, having dark matter have interactions, producing extra inhomogeneities, you know, you have to go back to the early universe, you have to calculate what the new sound speed would be, uh, what the new um, uh, time to uh, transparency would be. Um, you know, if there's any change, for example, to the effective 
uh, amount of radiation or radiation density. Um, and you have to make sure it, it's you know, an idea like that is compatible with the CMB and that it can produce this shift. What I like about this Hubble Hunter's Guide is it gives a pretty good generic description of how to do this, like you know where the action has to be over what redshift range, where the interactions have to be, um, and so you know it's it's hard work because the data is now so constraining to you know come up with an idea and make sure it actually isn't ruled out by data. But you know I'm excited for people to do that kind of work. It's beyond uh, what I can do, um, so I you know I'm an avid reader of the archive. Uh, so I think Rohan also had a question from the Q&A. Hi, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. And um, this question, it's a two-part question from Lucia Perez. It's, uh, can you speak about the current ongoing work in supernova modeling and exactly how well do we understand the true intrinsic luminosities of these supernovae? Um, right, well, so uh, from the way you asked the question, I'll think of this as sort of like there's almost a firewall between theory and empirical on this. Most of what I've talked, everything I've talked about really has been treating these as uh, empirical standard candles, you know, pretty much the way, you know, Mario and others, um, you know, myself in my doctoral thesis in the mid 1990s were treating these. A parallel effort has been to understand them theoretically, which is hard. Um, you know, we understand them certainly in pretty good uh, detail up until about the moment of the explosion. But uh, a real problem has been understanding what causes the ignition, what the conditions of the star are. Um, is it a, a gradual process of building accretion uh, by a single star that, you know, maybe is a giant spilling material over? Or are these two white dwarfs that are merging? Uh, does the explosion occur in the center? Is it an off-center explosion that wraps around and then produces an explosion? And uh, I... This is hard, and and you know these calculations are complex, uh, particularly when people try to do this from first principles. They struggle with the resolution at which you do the calculations in the computer. You know, it's like you build a grid and say, okay, I'm going to resolve the physics on different scales in a grid, and then you see one kind of explosion, and then you make that grid finer, and it changes the way the explosion looks. Now, nature shouldn't do that, right? You realize, oh, I'm really having a problem with the finite resolution of my ability to do this calculation. And so theorists have struggled in that area while people doing empirical work with supernovae have sort of treated this like a parallel exercise and said, okay, uh, I'm gonna just treat these as these objects are the same here as there if they look the same. Uh, we understand in broad brushstrokes what's going on, but I'll wait for some developments from theory to tell us you know, if there's something we need to know that's different. Um, Alvaro, you had a question? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam, for uh, such a wonderful talk. Uh, I have a two-part question also. Uh, first is, uh, wh why uh, keep using HST and not migrating shoes to another uh, brand new telescope, uh, much bigger and, 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 yeah. Yeah. and wider? Uh, and the second uh, question uh, is, how does... Uh, future uh, large big data surveys will impact on, on your future work, uh, such as a better wing telescope? Sure, let, let me start with the first question. So different telescopes have sort of, I would say different superpowers uh, and they're good at doing different things. Uh, some telescopes are big light buckets and they allow us to observe very faint things. Um, the Hubble has two superpowers that are particularly good for this problem, which is tremendous resolution because of the, um, fact that it's in space, uh, it uh, is a diffraction limited telescope. It's, it's not blurred by the atmosphere. And so we're trying to pick out individual stars called Cepheids that are blurred with other stars. And that separation problem is pretty unique to Hubble. The other is stability, that this is a telescope that will measure the same brightness of a star year after year. And so it allows us to make measurements that are consistent across the distance ladder, even if we don't make all those measurements on the same night. Um, so, uh, and then there are many ground-based projects in the future that I think will help with many of these other tools, but I'm not aware of a telescope I'm very confident in that is going to do the same technical things of Hubble, particularly in the blue uh, part of the spectrum, which is where Cepheids are found. And I think I saw Mario's hand up, so maybe he has another answer to this. No, oh, I was volunteering to ask a question from the public, from the Q&As. 
please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. There is a um, question by Mr. Alfredo Navarrete, and he says, due to the expansion of the universe, is there going to be a point in the future at which time the light of the galaxies will not reach the Earth and we will be only able to see the stars of the Milky Way? Maybe you want to take this question, Mario. No, no. No? No, no, go ahead, go okay, ahead. Okay, okay. Um, we think so. Uh, <laughs> it depends a little bit on the nature of dark energy, but if it is what it looks like it is, which is some basic fairly static energy, then eventually the expansion is faster than uh, essentially the speed of light. It's not that any object is moving faster than the speed of light, but this definition of the separation between two objects uh, becomes greater than the speed of light. So distant objects will not be able to send light back to us to see. However, there will be things that are still gravitationally bound to us that don't move far away, like we expect Andromeda. Uh, and so we will always be able to see Andromeda, especially as it comes and smacks us in the face uh, in probably a few billion years. So things that remain gravitationally bound to us, we'll still be able to see the very distant things. I think not, unless this story changes. Okay, Lucas also wanted to ask a question from the audience. The most avoided question so far is by Pranav uh, Limaye. Uh, is there any other standard candle more advanced and accurate than Tampani Supernovae? Uh, is it even possible using current technology or using upcoming uh, extremely large telescopes? And I know you alluded to you know, gravitational waves. I was going to say, maybe you want to answer this one. You, you, I think I know the answer, but go ahead. Well, uh, right. There's, a, there's a, uh, a kind of a standard candle uh, in gravitational waves, not in light which is, you know, could be a, a black hole in spiraling with a, a neutron star. And what's so interesting is uh, in gravitational waves, all that really matters for how luminous it is in gravitational waves is really how much mass is being combined. And it turns out in the, the way that the, the two stars merge, uh, there's a signature of the way the gravitational waves uh, look that tells you essentially how much mass is being combined. So it calibrates itself and then uh, is this great standard candle um, if you can see in gravitational waves. And there is both LIGO and uh, uh, additions to it and maybe LISA in the future, a space-based version of LIGO that may make this measurement. Now, having said that, you know, they haven't yet come up against all the challenges I think that we've been facing with light for decades, which is, you know, how do you calibrate the brightness of a gravitational wave. You know, how do you calibrate what's called, you know, the strain of your detector in some absolute sense or, or even some pretty good relative sense? So I think there are things that can, uh, but, you know, they may depend on technology that's very challenging. There are also other kinds of star types. I mentioned a, a number of those. Just being able to see out further with JWST and recognize fairly regular stars, we have good ideas of what their luminosity should be. So, uh, you know, I think there'll be other things, but I'm not aware of something that really challenges type 1a supernovae. There are type 2 supernovae, which is another type of supernova. Mario worked on that uh, in his doctoral thesis. They're a little less precise than type 1a supernovae. They're a little less luminous. So, you know, on their face, they're sort of less powerful. But sometimes the name of the game is cross checks, not just power of one object. Um, and so, you know, there, there's room for other techniques to uh, check these things. Also, so thinking of uh, masers that are farther away than HC 4258. Yep. Uh, your recent paper with uh, Dom and, and Mark. Right. Uh, and perhaps also uh, surface finance fluctuations as a technique may eventually uh, go out to the Hubble flow and, and give us a cross check of type 1 supernova, right? Right. But none of those are standard candles in, in the strict sense of the word, right? They're either standard sirens or, or just right. irregular. Right? So, so I have a question that's that I find quite an interesting one from the Q&A from Kaustav Gupta. Uh, there was a recent study showing that for white dwarfs with extremely large ma uh, magnetic fields, the Chandrasekhar limit might be exceeded. This means that type 1a supernovae might not be such, a good, such good standard candles as we currently assume. What are the implications of this for our understanding um, of the expansion of the universe? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and this comes up all the time. You know, there'll be some new uh, measurement of a type 1A supernova showing something different and, and questioning, well, you know, could that affect these measurements? You know, in a way, while we struggle to understand these, because we sort of took this fork in the road two decades ago of the theory and the empiric information, um, you know, the silly kind of thing is, uh, if you learn something new, it doesn't necessarily change the empirical process because we've always been comparing these objects sort of likes to likes. And so, for example, we make corrections for the shape of the light curve empirically, how it changes the luminosity. Now, what's driving that? We're never quite sure. So, you know, something somebody sees, a magnetic field uh, that causes the supernova to explode at a different mass, uh, may very well explain some of the empirical corrections that we're already using, like the width of the light curve, um, but they don't automatically tell us uh, how to change the empirics. It's sort of the, you know, it's the double-edged sword of using empirics is, you know, it protects you in, in some way against this, but it leaves you a little blind to a deeper understanding. Maybe Alejandro or Mario will have a better answer to that. Uh, I don't know if a better answer. I, I would like to comment that we do find uh, type 1a supernovae which are very bright i mean that are outside of the standard uh, correlation but uh, typically those are used in the uh, computing of cosmological relevant distances i mean they are left out it is still physically very interesting to try to come up with an answer how can it be that you get a type 1a supernova that is, that is twice as much as right as the normal one, because that will imply that somehow you do need to build a white dwarf, uh, which is uh, the generate, but with more mass than the Chandra second mass. Rotation can do the yeah, work. Yeah, can say that, of, rotation. But, but you will not put in your Hubble diagram supernovae, which are that bright, typically. Interesting. Uh, so I think we'll go to Thomas for the final question. Yeah, so I have one final question, but there is an interesting comment here in the Q&A by Joel Premack, um, who says... Joel Premack. Yeah, so they see an enhanced um, abundance of, of clusters and galaxies and high redshifts based on their simulations, their in-body models, of early dark energy. So everyone look at Clippy et al. 2020. <laughs> so, so this is something that, that gives an indication of early dark energy? He says, as a theoretical pioneer doing early yeah. dark experiments, he finds an overabundance. Right. Joel, send me an email uh, about the paper. I'd like to see it. <laughs> Wonderful. Clipping it out 2020. It's in the okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So maybe um, one last question. So um, I read that the Symmetry magazine reprinted parts of your lab book where you had the first indication of, of the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Um, can you describe a little bit the moment when it you know, first dawned on you that the deceleration parameter is negative? Right. Like the, um, when, when, when did you realize that? Like, what was right. the it, You know, I'd like, I'd like to say that you, know, you do a calculation or a measurement or you use your computer to do a program and you go, aha, the universe is accelerating. But it's usually much more boring and actually uh, nerve wracking than that. And in this case, it was one of those examples. I wasn't really thinking about acceleration. I thought we were, our experiment was measuring the mass density of the universe, what we call omega matter. And, uh, you know, uh, observers had seen that it was about 0.3, but theorists like Jim and others were saying, you know, you should really go to larger scales and make sure it isn't actually one if you go out further. So we got our first supernova data of this type that could measure this. Uh, and uh, I wrote a simple computer program telling me, okay, what is the best value for omega matter to fit this data? And you know, the result I got back from my program was a negative number. It was like minus 0.4 plus or minus 0.12 or something. That's what is in that lab notebook. And I remember writing that going, well, I'm writing down the answer, but this is ridiculous because you know, I, I must have messed up something in the equations. I must have messed up something in my computer code. I'm outside the bounds of what is physically possible. And I think it took me a few days to say, you know, oh, it really does look like the data wants that. There's got to be some other way to think of this. And, uh, you know, I went to uh, a colleague of ours, Sean Carroll's famous uh, paper describing the cosmological constant in the equations and saw, oh, here's a not crazy way that you could at least talk about this. 
Um, so, you know, it was a, a reluctance to get to it, uh, uh, driven by fear. <laughs> fear is a good motivator. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, are there any other questions from the, from the panel? I would like to just take a moment since this is in Chile. I mentioned it in my talk, but I want to highlight again the importance of uh, not just Chilean astronomy, but particularly, you know, this body of work that came from Chile, the Calantololo survey. Uh, we have Mario uh, Alejandro, who was involved uh, later with that, that um, I don't know how clear this was in my talk, but, you know, you can't measure the acceleration uh, if you can't measure it relative to something, the more nearby expansion of the universe. It's a little bit, you know, what's the expression of Archimedes? You know, you, he, could, he could lift anything if he has somewhere to stand. And the somewhere to stand is the, you know, local measurements from type 1a supernovae. So, you know, that, that work is, was uh, foundational to, uh, you know, modern cosmology. Mario? Oh, has a question. Yes. Uh... Well, thank you for reminding uh, us the contribution of the Calantololo project, Adam. Um, um, as you said, uh, it served as the basis for discovering the acceleration of the universe in 1998, complemented obviously with the data of the, of the high Z program. And uh, now that I just studied the revisited the cosmic distance ladder in my recent paper, I realized that the Calantololo uh, data uh, provided uh, the same answer essentially for the Hubble constant than the most modern samples. Even of course the error bars were bigger because the number of supernovae have, has increased. But it's re really reassuring to um, note that the Calantololo combined with your Cepheid distances uh, provides uh, a, value, a value for the Hubble constant of uh, 74. And I would also like to mention another important contribution from Chile to this um, cosmic distant ladder construction. And that's the work of the people from the University of Concepcion, uh, Gregor Spitrinsky and Wolfgang Giran. Thank you. They were the guys who measured the distance to the LMC uh, with, through the DEB uh, technique to a 1% one, uh, 1 precision. Thank you. That is, that is very true. Um, you know, it, it's funny, the, the work that came out of Kalantololo, in a way, was sort of good enough for the third rung of the distance ladder, even as it is today. Um, but it took a while for the other two rungs to catch up, I would say. And that's what's happened over the last 20 years. And so when people say, you know, well, uh, you know, it used to be so hard to measure the Hubble constant 50 to 100. Why would I believe we can measure it well now? And, you know, the answer I give is because there's been such dramatic improvements on rung one and rung two, uh, particularly on the geometric part. I mean, you know, to think we'd live in a time when we can geometrically calibrate out distances of kilo and megaparsecs to percent level precision, not just one way or two ways, but, you know, five, six, seven ways. And, you know, Gregor Petrinsky's group, you know, really led the way in one of the, really the best ways of doing that. So that's been, you know, very uh, important work. Uh, also to mention, of course, the Hubble Space Telescope, which, you know, was designed to measure the Hubble constant to 10% uh, and declare victory. It's remarkable that that same telescope can be pushed to get close to 1% uh, is just, you know, it's remarkable. Okay, uh, let's wrap up there. So thank you very much to Adam for telling us about your work and thank you to, for everyone else for joining us today and for all your questions. Uh, we will be sen sending out uh, a survey at the end of this Zoom webinar, so we'd really appreciate uh, receiving your feedback. If there's any, any suggestions or comments you want to make, um, and our next scheduled talk will be for October 2nd and will be given by Joe Silk, who will be telling us about the future of cosmology. For now, though, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you all again at the next Golden Webinar. Ciao. Bye, everyone. Bye.